Thanks so much for joining us today. Our hope and prayer is that God will use this message powerfully in your life and that it'll bring you closer to him. If you'd like more information about our church or if you'd like to hear more messages, you can visit vibechurch.com or download our app. Now get ready to receive a word from the Lord. Good morning, everyone. So good to see everybody this morning. What a great crowd, huh? Yeah. Don't forget to grab your, your wristband when you walk in the door so we can know how to, how to be able to, uh, to interact with you because we want to honor you. And, and uh, <laughs> I'm in a tin can this morning, so just bear with me. So how many of you have ever memorized a passage of Scripture? Yeah? Who wants to share their passage of Scripture they memorized? Come on. Michael, did you raise your hand? No? Yeah, you, you, you. No? Grace? I think you're right. No? On the spot. Can you quote it for me? Amen. Psalm 23. Great passage of Scripture. Anyone else ever memorized a passage of Scripture? Go ahead. Man, that's the same, yeah, Psalm 23, good deal, good, good passage of scripture. So scripture memory is such an important thing. Uh, listen, if, if, um, if you have never memorized a passage of scripture today, uh, I want to share one with you that is easy to memorize and I think would be important to memorize, but we're, we're in Route 66, our, our summer series, and we're going through the book of Romans, and uh, we're, we're in chapter 8, which is really uh, first of all, Romans is, is kind of like the, the, the Constitution is to the United States. Romans is to us as Christians because of the doctrine, the theology, the, 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 the biblical uh, instruction that Paul the Apostle gives us. It's so vital for us, for our walk with the Lord. It's such an, an important uh, book, and, and we get so much out of it. But when it comes to chapter 8, chapter 8 is considered the cornerstone chapter of the book of Romans. There are so many great verses of scripture and so much great instruction from God's word that we're actually going to camp out in chapter 8 for about six weeks, if you don't mind. And we're going to start out there today. But if you struggle with, with guilt, then you need to read chapter 8 in Romans. If you str struggle with sin, you need to read Romans chapter 8. If you're going through trials and and, and feel like you're being persecuted, you need to read Romans chapter 8. If you don't know how to pray, read Romans 8. And if you're struggling with your assurance of your salvation, not sure where you stand with God, you need to read Romans chapter 8. I don't know if you're getting the point yet, but you need to read Romans chapter 8. It's not a long chapter, uh, but read it. Read it. It's so, so important. Uh, how many of you ever noticed the, or, or, or realized the importance of, of being in something, whether, you know, if you're in a bad storm and, uh, and something's going on around you, the importance of being in something. Some of you maybe have served in, in, in combat and, uh, and you know the, uh, the importance of being in an armored vehicle, you know, when, when things are going on around you. About six years ago, um, Robin and I and, and our kids, we went camping up at Carolina Adventure World, which is like exit I don't know, 30, 40, something up, up uh, I-77, and it's a place where you can rent dirt bikes and four-wheelers and stuff like that, and you can camp out. And, and so we went after church on Sunday, and we went out there, and, and we roll up and, uh, and pop up our tent. You know, there's people out there, and then all of a sudden, little by little, they all start leaving, you know, and then we realize, oh, yeah, it's Sunday. Their, their weekend is over, you know, so for me, it's just like, you know, weekends aren't the same as everybody else, you know. So, you know, so we're, we end up being the only ones in the campsite, which is pretty cool. You know, it's like, all right, we have a place to ourselves. And until it got dark, and, uh, and all of a sudden, there was a, like a pack of coyotes. If you've ever heard coyotes around you, they sound like demonic. And they're like, Wah! Like, what, what the world are they doing over there? You know, like, they're just going crazy. And they would just, they would just move. And we're in the tent, and we have our little puppy dog, little Bella. And uh, she weighs about five pounds, sopping wet. And, 
and, and we're thinking, they can smell her. They're going to come get her. You know, we're in the tent, and all I brought was a knife. And so I'm like, ah, you know, it sounds like there's a hundred of them. It's probably two. But, uh, but they, just, they just moved around, you know, and they were just like all going. And then, you know, Robin says, you're going to kill me, but I got to go to the bathroom. I'm like, what? <laughs> no, and the bathhouses, you know, seemed like miles away. It was probably just, you know, 100 yards or so. But it was, it was in the coyote zone, you know, and so we're like, how do we do this? You know, so anyway, we, we, uh, so it was hard to sleep that night, you know, with, uh, with just a knife and, and, uh, and trying to protect ourselves. We didn't get attacked by any coyotes. But I tell you what, there was, it was just a sense of security because we were in this little tent. When you, you look at the tent, it's like there's not much to it. But it was enough, right? It was just enough to keep me and, and the kids and Robin from from uh, in, encountering the coyotes. and So maybe you, you've been in those situations. You know, I like to watch storms whenever uh, they, they, they roll in. I like to sit on the back porch in a screen porch and just watch it. You know, I don't like to be in them, but I love to watch them. I love to see even when trees get blown over. It's like, yes, but I don't like to be in that, right? Um, and maybe you're in the same situation. And Romans chapter 8 is such an important passage of Scripture. Now, again, if you haven't memorized this passage of Scripture, please, please take time to do that. Do, do that. Memorize it. It's easy. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. All right, we're going to learn it together. We're going to memorize it. We're going to say, therefore, come on, everybody repeat after me. Therefore, therefore there, is now there is now no condemnation, no condemnation. to those who are in Christ Jesus. There are four words or phrases that we're going to look at in this passage. I know it's, it's not a big passage of Scripture, not a lengthy passage of Scripture, but it is chocked full of important stuff for you and I, that if we can grab a hold of it, this is why it's so important for you and I to memorize this passage. Because this is one of those verses that the enemy will try to remind you of all kinds of stuff from the past. Uh, people will try to remind you you know, of things of the past. And this is one of those passages of Scripture and verses of Scripture that you can recall from memory, that you can quote it, and just something happens when we quote Scripture. Something happens, something powerful takes place in our hearts when we feel the, the enemy's attack and we, we start to quote God's Word, something powerful happens. So we're going to look at these four words or phrases, right? So it's, therefore, now... No condemnation in Christ Jesus. Those are the four words and phrases that we're going to look at. First, I want to look at therefore, because, you know, when, you, when you're reading Romans chapter 8, verse 1, you got to understand that Romans chapter 8, one, verse 1 is the great conclusion. So Romans 8, 1, in this passage, this verse of Scripture is the conclusion drawn from chapters 1 through 7. As Paul's writing to the church in Rome, to the Christians there, as as the Holy Spirit is guiding him and leading him to write that letter to the Romans, to the Roman church, but also it extends to us as the Word of God. And, and the, these words, it is, it's the, the, the um, conclusion of chapters 1 through 7. How a perfect and holy God that we just sang about, he can bring a guilty, sinful person into a right standing relationship. That's chapters 1 through 7. And Paul's saying in verse 1 of chapter 8, Therefore, because of all that, because a holy God has taken us and put us in right standing, in a right place, it's, it's as if we've never sinned before. We're standing before God because of Jesus all, like, like we've never even sinned. We're pure. We're clothed. In his righteousness, in the righteousness of Christ. We're not standing in our own righteousness, but we're clothed in his righteousness. And therefore, because of all that, therefore, now, all the years prior, all those years prior, the law commanded and the law condemned. The lawbreakers. See, the, the, those who were Jewish and in the church there in Rome, there were, there were many. That, there, there were 
Gentile believers, those who weren't Jewish, and then there were those who were Jewish. And again, they, they, you know, some believe that the church in Rome was started uh, as a result of the day of Pentecost, and you know, believers came back, and uh, there's no one person that we know of that actually is responsible for starting the church, but, but there were Jewish believers, and, and those Jewish believers, all of their life, and not just their life, but all of their parents' lives, and all of their grandparents and great-grandparents, and you get the point, all the way back, they followed the law. And the law commanded and the law condemned lawbreakers. And the law also pointed to a righteousness and a sacrifice that would someday come. But the law could never remove sin or cond condemnation from us. See, we stood guilty before God. We stood guilty before God. And for the Jewish believers who had for years and years and centuries and, and decades, and, and you know, they, they, they followed the law, and the law commanded them and, and, and actually condemned sin and condemned the sinner. See, if there was ever going to be a time when, when sinners could be released from that condemnation or or if they could experience that, that no condemnation, then God had to do something besides give another law. And when Jesus came on the scene, he didn't come to bring another law. He didn't come to, to give one more rule to the list. He came to fulfill it. And so what God did, instead of sending another rule, another law, you know, another thing for us to do, and what he did is he sent his son. He sent his son as a human, as our representative and our substitute. And there on the cross, in the suffering of his son, God condemned sin. He condemned sin on the cross. So now we look in a rearview mirror to remind us that Christ has died and become our condemnation. But we also look forward. We look ahead as we, as we do, as we see, we see the judgment coming for every person who's outside of Christ. See, there's a terrible storm approaching. Terrible storm. A storm that, that we can't face on our own. We already talked a little bit about the judgment of God and judging others and all that stuff, but, but we know God will judge sin. Sin will be judged. And there's a terrible storm coming. And if we're not in Christ, if we're not in a relationship with him, then we face that judgment. But now, therefore, because of Romans chapter 1 through 7, therefore, because of what Jesus did for us and how he made us right and put us in a right relationship with the Father. Therefore, now, there's no condemnation. You, you remember when your parents would ask you, what don't you understand about no? How many of you repeat your parents? Just one or two? Do you ever find yourself repeating things that they would say, and then you, when it comes out of your mouth, you're like, what did I just say? It happens all the time. What did I just say? And, and, and so, you know, what, what don't you understand about no? There's no condemnation. Somebody needs to hear this. Somebody needs to embrace this this morning. Because for some reason, you think you're exempt from that. For some reason, you, you feel like, oh, no, I've, you know, I've done so much wrong. Or, I, you know, I just, I, I haven't done everything right and, and whatever. And so it, there's maybe it's still a little condemnation for me. Listen, there's no condemnation. Therefore, therefore, because of what Jesus did for us now, right now, right now, not in the future, right now, there is no condemnation. Condemnation is a, is, a, is a legal term, and it, it includes both the sentence 
and the ex execution of the sentence. And we all stand before God guilty. Guilty and condemned to eternal punishment. It's like we're on death row. We're just waiting for our execution. And if we died in that condition, we would pass into eternal separation from God. But since Christ bore the punishment that we deserved, see, Jesus became our condemnation. He took on our sin for us. Since Christ bore that punishment, that we deserved. In him we are set free. We stand before God justified. Like we've never sinned before. In right standing with the father. Acquitted. And all of the charges dismissed. I tell you when you start to understand this. That's when worship really takes on meaning. It's not a song that we sing. I know that you know, the music part of it is great, but when you start to understand, this is what God has done for me. I didn't deserve it. It doesn't matter if you've gone to church all your life or if you've served in charities or whatever. You know, it doesn't matter. It's, it, it, nothing we do can put us in a right relationship with God what Jesus did for us. And when you understand that, something happens inside of you. Something starts to rise up within us and we realize that this is the God that we serve. He loves us and cares for us and, and, and he's worthy of our praise. This is the most important phrase in this whole passage. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. There's no condemnation for you because of what Jesus has done. This is the most important part of that verse. For those who are in Christ Jesus. For those who are in Christ Jesus. This, this pardon, this, this uh, well, no condemnation, uh, this justification, this acquittal, all of this it's not just some blanket thing that God just throws out over all of humanity and you don't have to do anything for it, you just got it. It would be great in some ways, I guess, but in, in other ways, no, I don't, maybe not so great. But it's for those who are in Christ Jesus. That means you got to do something, right? You're like, wait, wait, I, I, thought, I, I thought there wasn't anything I could do. It's for those who are in Christ Jesus. For those who surrender their hearts, their lives to Christ. We saw already in, in Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 6 that there are two categories of people. There are those who are in Adam, who was the first human, who was our, our you know, representative. He was, you know, the spiritual DNA is passed down uh, from him. And, and that's where we're born with this sinful nature. Uh, so there's those who are in Adam and those who are in Christ. Those who are in Adam are under God's just condemnation. And they face his awful wrath for their sins. But those who are in Christ have been clothed with, clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And his death has paid the penalty for our sins, right? Right? So that God can be both just and the justifier, the one who has to the one for the one who has faith in, in him. See, for the unbeliever, judgment is before them. But for the believer, for those who are in Christ, judgment is behind us. When God decided to destroy the earth. He decided to do it through flooding the earth, and, and the only thing that mattered was, were you on the ark? Now we know, because of the biblical record, who was on the ark, but the most important thing, the, the only important thing was, are you on the ark? Are you in 
the ark? Are you safe? You know, people could say, well, I'm a decent person. I, you know, I'm a good person. But are you in the ark? Are you, are you safe? The only ones who were saved were those who were in the ark. So my question to you, are you on board? Are you in Christ? Are you safe? Are you with Jesus? Now we've talked about this already through this series and we'll talk about it again just because it's so important. And Paul raises the, 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 the question because of what he says that there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So the question, it's not a trivial question, it's a very important question. Are you in Christ Jesus? Are you in Jesus? See, I'm not under condemnation when I'm under grace. I'm not under condemnation when I'm under grace. Have you fled to Jesus as your refuge? Are you in him? Now, how do you really know if you're a Christian? So I want to I take some, you know, kind of dive in a little bit if we can. How do you really know if you're a Christian? Because Christianity, let's, you know, be honest, it's, it's gotten watered down. You know, it's just kind of like, you know, if you believe in Jesus, if you go to church, or maybe if you watch church once in a while, or, or if you listen to Christian radio once, you know, what, what does it mean to be in Christ? What, does it mean going to church? Does it mean going to a building? Does it mean being a part of a group? What does it mean to be in Christ, to really be a Christian? What assurance do I have? I believe there's objective assurance and subjective assurance. The objective assurance comes from the outside. It's, it's, it's based on the godly things that the Holy Spirit produces in our lives. See, if we're in Christ, there's that, that objective assurance because things are changing changing. The Holy Spirit is at work in my heart and in my life. I've been around people who have been around church a lot. And I've seen people who have been around church for a long time, but it seems like nothing's going on. You know what I'm saying? That the Holy Spirit is, is not producing anything any kind of fruit. It's like a, a, an orange tree that just never produces, right? I think the objective assurance of knowing if my life is in Christ is that things are changing in my heart, in life. There's fruit. There's, there's evidence. The Holy Spirit's at work. Things that I used to do or I used to think or I used to say, those things, I don't want to do those anymore. We talked about that last week. And I find myself changing. This is, this is where sometimes churches can get real sticky and it can get ugly and, you know, because sometimes we want to help people grow spiritually, right? I say we. I don't necessarily mean Vive Church. We, we're really careful to try not to try to help people grow spiritually and say, you don't need to do that. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. Listen, the Holy Spirit will produce fruit in a believer's life. I believe my responsibility, your responsibility is to present truth, lead people into truth. If, if people encounter truth, it transforms us. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth, the spirit of truth. He guides us. And so there's that objective assurance. The subjective assurance is based on something within us. It's the witness of the spirit. It's something that you know. If people, you know, I've had people ask me, well, how do you know that you're a Christian? You know, man, I, I just know. There's that, that is, there's that assurance. There's that confidence that I have, not in anything I've done, but just in knowing because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in my heart. See, I, I think there are two tests that tell the truth. There's the doctrinal test. One is Part of that doctrinal test is, do you confess Christ? Do you confess him? Your beliefs about Christ will validate your claim to be a Christian. Do you say the same thing about Christ that God says in the Bible? Are you talking about Jesus? Do you confess him? 
as your Savior. The second part of that doctrinal test of, of, of how do we know if we're, we're in him is do you confess your sin? First, do you confess Christ? And then two, do you confess your sin? If someone comes along and tells me that you know, they're a Christian but doesn't acknowledge sin, I don't believe them. I don't believe you if, if you don't acknowledge sin. I, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glory, right? 1 John 6.10 says, if we say that we fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So are you confessing Christ? Are you confessing your sin? That's the doctrinal test. The, the moral test is, do you obey God's word? Do you obey his word? As we encounter truth, see, truth, when, when we're presented with truth, we have choices to make. We can reject it. We can uh, suppress it. Or we can accept it. And there are things that God says in his word. There, there's truth that, that when we stand face to face with it, it's tough because it challenges the way we're living. It challenges who we are. It challenges what we're comfortable with, what we've grown accustomed to. And kind of sometimes how we, we've almost created our identity around our sin. And, and when we're confronted with truth, it's like, ah, you know, what do I do with this? If you want to know, you know, man, am I in Christ? Are you, are you embracing that truth? Or when you're confronted with truth, do you look for ways to skirt around it? Do you look for things to, you know, to, to try to, like, maybe, like, compare yourself with other people? Well, I'm not as bad as, as that person. I'm not as bad as this person. That's not the question. Are you obeying God's word? Are you embracing truth? Are you allowing the truth of God's word to transform you? 1 John 2, 3 says... By this, we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So if we're embracing that truth, we know that we're his. The second part of that moral test, there's the biblical test, uh, then there's the moral test, and that's do you obey God's word? And then secondly, do you love others? Do you love others? 1 John 2.10 Whoever loves his brother lives in the light. There's something powerful that happens in our lives as we grow in our relationship with him. That his love is made perfect in us. That it's not just something we talk about. It's not just something we sing about. But it's something that grows in us. And we find ourselves loving others. Even others that we don't even know. Maybe others that even, you know, think differently than us and talk differently than us and, and act differently than us. Maybe even others who don't even live in the same country that we live in and they're, they're uh, you know, across the ocean. But there's something that happens in us that that love grows so much so that, that we're willing to, to give of our money to support a missionary who's, who's called to go and reach these people because the love of God is growing in us, and it's, it's, it's transforming us. And we're willing to even go on a missions trip, and we're willing to take the gospel to a people who desperately need it. We're willing to, to maybe even talk to the person in the cubicle next to us, or uh, which I guess you can't do that now, but, uh, you know. We're willing to talk to our neighbor. We're willing to... Strike up a conversation, build a relationship, because the love of God is, is just growing inside of us. So the question is, do you love others? Do you, do you love people? That's a sign of, of the Holy Spirit working in us. It's a sign that, 
that something's going on spiritually in us. If you're still just in love with yourself, then there's probably a problem there. But is God's love growing? Is it perfecting in us? Therefore, because of all that Jesus has done for us, because of the gospel, therefore, because of that, because of what Jesus did, therefore, there is now. There's now, right now, in your life, in your heart, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. See, the next time the enemy wants to remind you of the past and he wants to remind you of all your failures, the next time you wake up and you don't feel real spiritual, do y'all wake up spiritual all the time? Yeah, me neither. If you have one of those days where you're waking up and you're not feeling real spiritual and you're just wanting to, you know, I don't know what you want to do when you, but, but you know, something not your, what you're not supposed to do. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I don't know about you, but the enemy always tries to remind me of the past. And there are times when I just don't, I don't feel as spiritual as others. And I have to remind myself, there's no condemnation. Jesus took my condemnation. I stand before the Father, holy and righteous, because I'm clothed in Christ. I'm safe. I'm safe because I'm in Him. And no matter what happens around me, no matter what storm takes place, no matter how many coyotes and, and wild animals and crazy stuff goes on around me, I am safe because I am in Christ Jesus. There's no better place to be in Christ Jesus. Would you stand with me? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes after you stand up so you don't fall over? I want to pray with you if I can. Are you in Jesus? You know, when Noah was building that ark, I'm sure as he was building it, people just, they would walk by and they would laugh, they'd ridicule. Why are you doing that? Why don't you come party with us? Why don't you come do what we're doing? Come on, what, what are you wasting your time for? What are you doing that for? You're crazy. Who believes this stuff? It's fairy tales. It's not going to rain. What's it even mean to rain? It had never rained before, so they don't know. Like, what is this rain thing you're talking about? People may say the same thing when you talk about Jesus coming back. They're like, yeah, whatever. I've heard that story before. So what is it? Why, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you trying to get closer to Jesus? Why are you, you know, and I'm sure they would ridicule him. I'm sure they would mess with him. And, but one day they walked into that ark, that big old boat, and the door was shut, and it started to rain. Listen, there's going to come a time and a day where the whole world, the whole earth, the Bible says, will be judged. And if you're in Christ, your judgment's behind you. Your sin's already been judged, been judged on the cross. But if you think, oh no, I think I can do this myself. I think I can, I can, I can handle this thing. I can, I can live this life and, you know, all on my own then your judgment's still before you. Are you in Christ? Would you bow your heads with me? Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor Randy, I'm, I'm not where I need to be. I, I want my life to be in Christ. I want to pray for you. Father, I ask, Lord, that you would just stir faith 
in hearts. Faith and courage to take that step and uh, to follow you and to trust you. And if that's you this morning, can I pray with you? Just you, me, and God. You say, Pastor Randy, pray for me. Would you slip up your hand? I want to be in Christ. I want my life to be in Him. I want to know that I'm safe, that I'm in the right place. Can we pray together? Would you just keep your hand raised? You say, Jesus, I give my heart, my life to you. Jesus, I accept what you did on the cross for me. You condemned my sin on the cross. And because of that, I embrace you. And I, I clothe myself in your righteousness, your holiness. And I submit my heart to you and I come under your lordship and your leadership. I give you my life. I give you my heart. And I trust you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. We're hoping that this message brought you to life. If you have any prayer requests or if you'd like to connect with our church family, you can email us at info at vivechurch.com or you can fill out the contact card section in our app. We're looking forward to hearing about all the ways that God is moving in your life. And until next time, go bring somebody to life.